If you would turn now in your Bibles to uh, 3 John. Third John, we'll be looking at the first four verses, so I'll read the whole epistle for the sake of overall context. And as we saw with Second John, and even with First John, the overarching themes that seem to be repeated, they're kind of themes that are favorite of the Apostle John. We saw them in John's Gospel, First John, saw them again in Second, and we'll see them here in Third John. 3 John, beginning at verse 1. This is the word of our God. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on their journey in a manner worthy of God. For they have gone out for the sake of the name, accepting nothing from the Gentiles. Therefore, we ought to support people like these that we may be fellow workers for the truth. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So, if I come, I will bring up what he is doing, talking wicked nonsense against us. And not content with that, he refuses to welcome the brothers, and also stops those who wants to and puts them out of the church. Beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know that our testimony is true. I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon, and we will talk face to face. Peace be to you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends, each by name. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. One thing that is being lost in today's day and age is the ability to write letters. Now, truth be told, I can't say that I'm one who knows how to do it well myself. Even my own emails can be choppy at times. But there is an art to it. It is quite remarkable when you find old letters that individuals have written. In fact, even letters from like maybe 50 to 100 years ago from people that were supposedly uneducated, how fluent their words are. The ease with which they write. And we think in our educated society how wonderful we must be to live in such a day and an age. And yet we have difficulty with simple communication. And a lot of times you look at those letters and you see the intimacy among friends, the concern that they have for one another, the telling of news, sometimes even instructions. Well, as we look at the epistles in the New Testament, there are a lot of those same types of things. But of course, Paul and Peter and John, they sure seem to know how to write letters. Now, oh, it is true that they all wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but they weren't put in some sort of weird trance, like suddenly the Spirit came upon them and they zoned out while they just sort of dictated. No, the reality is what we see, though inspired by God, though by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is their own personality coming through. God used them to give us these letters. As we consider and go through John's epistles and John's gospel even prior to that, we see John's concern for truth. 
we see John's concern with the truth of who Jesus Christ is and what he came to do. He's concerned that his people would have assurance. He's concerned that his people would walk in the accordance to the commands of God. And he's concerned about the testimony that Christians make. Well, third John is aptly named. It's, some scholars think that third John might be part of what you might call a packet where all three epistles came at once, where 1 John was general and was supposed to be sent out to the region, and 2 John was for a specific church, and now 3 John, of course, for a specific individual. Now, that's possible. We can't know for certain. I tend to think that 2 and 3 John fit that bill a little bit better than all three, but be that as it may, we have uh, actually in Paul's writing, a similar thing that takes place. When Paul was imprisoned early on, he wrote to the Colossian church, but then he also wrote to Philemon, who was there. So we do see that as a bit of a pattern. So 3 John, though, is like 1 John and like 2 John, but he is, of course, concerned for steadfastness. And particularly with Gaius, that they remain steadfast despite the opposition that they sometimes face. Now, John here is, for the most part, quite positive. We don't see uh, uh, things like Paul does in Galatians, for instance. When Paul writes Galatians, he gets right to it. Who has bewitched you? You might say in our own language, it's what's wrong with you people? But here there is much grace, much love, much affection. And it gives us a good guide as to how we ought to relate one to another. But as we look particularly at the first four verses, those are concepts we saw in 2 John and really throughout John's gospel and 1 John as well. So again, it comes to one of these situations is we're seeing the same thing again. Why? Why do we have to read the same basic thing again and again? It's because we forget again and again, and we need these reminders. And so we come to 3 John. So what I hope to show out of the first four verses of this short epistle is simply this, that Christians must pray for continued blessing for one another even as we rejoice in their growth in truth. Christians must pray for continued blessing for one another, even as we rejoice in their growth in truth. We're going to look at this under two headings. Simply, first off, prayer for Gaius, and then secondly, news of Gaius. So prayer for Gaius and news of Gaius. So first of all, prayer for Gaius. Look again at verse 1. The elder to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you and that you may be in good health as it goes well with your soul. Now here John identifies himself as he did in 2 John as the elder. He doesn't self-identify in another way. He doesn't even give his name. That was the case in the gospel account. That was the case in 1 John and again in 2 John. But like 2 John, he calls himself the elder. And as we saw then, as we looked at 2 John, it's probably best to understand that the reason why he calls himself the elder is because he was the last surviving apostle and hence the elder. He's not just any elder, and it's just a reminder of his position and his status with respect to the church. Nevertheless, he still has such loving words and compassionate words for the people that are under his care. What you could think of as when he addresses himself as the elder, it could just be something along the lines of a return address on the envelope. And then you've got the address to the beloved Gaius. Now, throughout much of church history, 3 John has been pretty much been attributed to be the Apostle John as the author, and we really don't have any quibble with that. But who is Gaius? 
The epistle is not specifically addressed to a church like 2 John was, the elect lady referring to a church, but this is to an individual. So in that respect, it's like Philemon. It's like 1 or 2 Timothy or Titus, personal individual letters. Gaius is the name. Now, this is where it gets difficult because there are three Gaiuses mentioned in the New Testament. We've got one who was Paul's companion from Macedonia. You can find that in Acts chapter 19, verse 29. There's another one from Derby in Acts chapter 20, verse 4. And yet another in Corinth who is mentioned at the end of the book of Romans as well as the beginning of 1 Corinthians. Could this Gaius be one of those three? Maybe. We don't really know. And so, because Gaius is not an uncommon name, it could actually be a fourth Gaius. We just don't really know. And the truth of the matter is, this is a case where the identity of the individual doesn't play much of a role in understanding. Obviously, the identity of Timothy and Titus played a much greater role in understanding those epistles. But in this context, Gaius, knowing that it's to an individual, we really ought to focus on the content of the message itself and, and really come back with some of the general principles that John lays out for him. There's not much else there on Gaius. He's just mentioned, and that's it. But I want you to notice what he does say about him. He's beloved. He's beloved. And the root of that word is our common, what we sometimes wrongly attribute to being merely a Christian word. It's not. Agape. He is loved. John loves this individual just as he loves the church, just as he loves all the members of the church. And notice, he's beloved whom I love in truth. It is not a love that is just a warm, fuzzy feeling. I'm sure there are some feelings of affection there, to be sure, but it is love that is in truth. It is love that not only truly is loving, but it is a love that is grounded in truth. And it is ultimately grounded in the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how our love ought to look for one another. We ought to be beloved of one another and also love one another in truth. And of course, we know truth is personified in Christ Jesus our Lord. Whom I love in truth. And notice in verse 2, we get to the heart of the prayer. For the second time, he calls him beloved, that quickly. Beloved, then you have the verb love, and then he calls him beloved again. I pray that all may go well with you, and that all may go well with you, and that you would be in good health, and that it goes well for your soul. Now, one of the things about this is that it's not impossible that uh, especially judging from letters that were written in this time, that this is just a simple greeting. That's true. It could be. But given that this is written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, this is not just a polite expression. There is deep affection that is here. And so if he truly is, if John really loves Gaius, why wouldn't he pray these things for him? So my question to you as we start to unfold this, and this is a question you'll need to answer as we go, do you love one another enough to pray for each and every person individually in the church? I realize a growing church that sometimes makes it uh, uh, difficult. Maybe pray for some people one day, more people the next day, save the special request for every day, whatever the case may be. But the truth of the matter is we have a pattern that is being set before us, praying for one another individually by name because we love one another. And hopefully we love one another in truth. 
Notice the content of the prayer. And again, be asking yourself, do you pray for these things for one another? Praise that all may go well with him. Praise that all may go well with him. Why would we pray this? Because we live in a fallen world. That's probably the first thing to remember. We live in a fallen world. We deal with struggles. We deal with those who sin against us. We deal with our own sin within us. And we deal with the general effects of sin. And we have to deal with it. Anybody who lives for any uh, amount of time will experience the basic effects of sin in this world. Those aches and pains trying to get up out of bed this morning. Those are the effects of sin. Doesn't mean you sinned to have this as a punishment on you. Maybe you got sick this past week. Maybe you had to go to the doctor because of a recurring illness. Those are the effects of sin. This is what we deal with. And so why would we not, out of love and concern for one another, pray that things go well for you and notice that he continues that you would have good, good health? This is not a, a health and wealth gospel here. This is just what the people of God ought to be doing. It sets before us a basic pattern of praying for one another, that all would go well with him. Praise that he would be in good health. This is not just a common greeting. though There are many, many letters of the day that seem to indicate similar things as just a, a, a polite expression. This is sincere. He loves him in truth. Now, brothers and sisters, if you love one another in truth, that will reflect itself in how you pray for one another. Do you pray that it goes well for everyone? Do you pray for good health? My friends, this is part of the reason we have a, a prayer list, that we try to go through it on a regular basis, that we have a family in focus so that we can get through each and every family. And we pray for specific individuals with health needs. And of course, ultimately, we pray that the Lord would grow us spiritually, grow us in the love of our Savior. Pray that all would go well. And notice as he wraps up verse 2, as it goes well with your soul. You see, we tend to have a focus one way or the other. And obviously, they're distinct. Good health, well, that concerns the body. Our spiritual walk, well, that concerns our soul. But the two are interconnected. Don't forget, we're not Gnostics. We've been talking about Gnosticism for a really long time now. Body and soul united together. That's partly what it is. We're, we're creatures that are made in God's image, body and soul. And we want to pray for the whole man, not just one, not just the other, but for body and soul. And you think, boy, that sounds so simple. Of course I know that. But are we doing it? That's the question. It's easy for us to look at passages of Scripture like this and see something that is so basic, so clear, and just pass right over it because, after all, we know it already. I mean, we do that with the stories in the Old Testament. Oh, yeah, I'm familiar with the creation account. Right through. It doesn't make it any less profound. In fact, our familiarity for such things ought to inspire within us greater awe. It should move us to greater appreciation of the simplicity of God's commands and, and the examples that we have set before us. Do we pray for one another? All of this provides a nice, basic, simple guide for us in our prayer life, particularly on this horizontal level as we pray for one another. To be sure, this is a specific prayer of John for an individual. Nevertheless, it is still a guide on how we ought to pray for one another. 
Every human is both body and soul, and our prayers for one another ought to reflect this truth. Simple, I know. I would encourage you, think about these things. We provide this prayer list, not just so you can follow along during the worship service, but we give you this prayer list to take home with you. Put it up on your fridge. Put it in your Bible. Put it in your devotional book. Whatever the case may be that will make you take this out and start specifically praying for individuals according to their needs, body and soul. That's what we need. There's nothing profound here. And yet, it's those things that seem to be so simple, so easy, so common, common knowledge among Christ's people that we tend to overlook them. Because after all, we want to study the deeper things, so to speak. By the way, don't shy away from the deep things. Just don't neglect the so-called simple ones either. Well, that's the prayer for Gaius. May it be our prayer for one another. This brings us to our second point then, news of Gaius. Look now at verse 3. For I rejoice greatly when the brothers came and testified to your truth, as indeed you are walking in the truth. Now you notice there that verse 3 begins with 4. And so it clearly follows, there's an argument being made, as it were, from what he just got done saying. What we're seeing here is John giving the reason why he's praying these things. Four. And he begins by saying, I rejoiced greatly, or I rejoiced exceedingly. John's prayer of verse 2 came about because he rejoiced exceedingly over something. What was that something? What is it that John is rejoicing over? Well, brothers came and testified to his truth. Brothers came and testified to his truth. Well, the first thing is, who are these brothers? Well, verses 5 and 8 seem to help us a little bit. So notice in verse 5, Beloved, it is a faithful thing you do in all your efforts for these brothers, strangers as they are, who testified to your love before the church. It seems, and most, most commentators, at least good conservative biblical commentators, see these men as basically missionaries that travel going from place to place. He calls them brothers. That's an indication that he recognizes them as true believers, but they're also strangers at the same time. Even this begins to give us a picture of how we ought to react to other Christians. Sure, we shouldn't be naive. For example, I've had on multiple occasions, people from around the country give me a call hey, so-and-so is traveling here. Do you actually know them? Yes, I do. They're a member in good standing. Yes, I do. I know this person because of this. So we do check up and we make sure we're not being led astray in some fashion. But once they're, con they're sure of an individual who in this congregation might be traveling here, might be traveling there, and want to visit another church or even have them pick them up at the airport, they call me up and they say, do you know this person? Yes, I do. They're a member in good standing. Okay, great. They may be a stranger, but they've just had confirmation. They've had testimony that they're a brother. And we ought to treat them as such. Well, these brothers come and they give good news about Gaius. They give testimony. And think about how important testimony has been as we've gone through John's gospel, 1 John, and 2 John. Here it comes again. These brothers come and they testify to his truth. Now the NIV interprets this, and there was one other translation, I forget which, but interprets this in this way. It's Gaius' faithfulness to the truth. 
And that seems to fit the general description. The way the ESV has it translated, it is pretty wooden, and that's the way it reads. That's the way it reads in the Greek. You were walking, or excuse me, when the brothers came and testified to your truth. At the very least, what we see John describing is the testimony that these brothers give to John concerning Gaius, and Gaius has made the truth his own. Gaius has made the truth his own. And that's why John is rejoicing. I rejoiced because of this. This is why I'm rejoicing. It's the testimony that these brothers give concerning the fact that you have made the truth your own. Do you rejoice when you see other believers, people that you may not even know, and you see, that's an individual who made Christ his own. We should rejoice. We should give thanks and praise when we see fellow believers because they are a walking, living, breathing testimony of God's grace. You are a living, breathing testimony of God's grace. And we should rejoice in our hearts when we see this and when we receive testimony of, of others. It's always wonderful when you get news. Uh, since I was reflecting on this not that long ago for other reasons, but thinking about the years that I spent as a clerk of two different sessions previously, and you think about and you get contacts, letters of transfer from other churches of like faith and practice, as our Book of Church Order describes it, and they give testimony of their faith where you give testimony of their lifestyle in their church and how they're sad to see them go, but are thankful that they are joining another church of like faith and practice. And I've had to send letters like that when people leave and they move for whatever reason, and you send a letter and you testify to their faith. That's what's being described here. Do we rejoice in such things? It is the truth that Gaius has claimed for himself. But I want you to notice, it's not just testimony to whether it's truth claimed to himself or even the faithfulness to the truth. It's not truth that's just up here in our heads. As we've seen time and time again, especially through 1 John, it is that Gaius is walking in the truth. He's walking in the truth. The truth has gone from his head into his heart and out to his hands and feet. The mind, the heart, and the will. And truth be told, that's how all preaching should come across. It should come across as affecting the, heart, the mind, the heart, and the will. If preaching only affects the mind, that's just a lecture. If it only affects the will, well, what's the basis for us doing it? And if our hearts are not moved in love, love for Christ, love for one another, what's the point? Gaius is walking in the truth. The truth has so affected him that he is now living out that truth. It's truth that is moved into his affections and into his will. He desires to walk in the truth. Can that be said of you? That's a very probing question, I know. It is a question designed to get you to examine yourself. Are you walking in the truth, not just simply having the truth up here in your head to score debate points online. That's a mirror to me too, believe me. But the fact of the matter is, it has to be truth that moves to our heart and then to our will. It has to be truth that is demonstrated. 
demonstrated in how we love one another and also how we love the loss. Are we walking in the truth? Of course, that means in order to walk in the truth, you need to know the truth. You can't separate the mind, heart, and the will. Acting out the truth requires you knowing the truth, loving the truth. All three are connected, walking in the truth. And in verse 4, we have something that we've seen, that we saw in the beginning of 2 John. You could turn back there. It's probably just one page over. Some may even have it on the same page. But in 2 John, his letter to the church there, verse 4, I rejoice greatly to find some of your children walking in the truth, just as we were commanded by the Father. He commends the church that some of them are walking in the truth, just as they were commanded. Now, no doubt, especially if 2nd and 3rd John came as kind of a package, that Gaius heard the general letter to the church and now is reading this to himself. The two cannot be separated. It's understood that though we are walking in the truth, that's commanded by God. We are commanded to walk in the truth. That is certainly true. But John rejoices in the reality that Gaius is walking in the truth. So my question is, do you rejoice when you see one another walking in the truth? John puts it this way, my children walking in the truth. Some might say, I mean, honestly, if I got up here and said this, it's so good to see my children walking in the truth. Your first thought may, may be, I hope he's referring to his own kids. Because in our culture, that might seem a little bit odd. But remember, even last week, when we took a bit of a hiatus from looking at John's epistles, when we looked at the fifth commandment, remember what David called Saul, even as he took that little corner of the robe off. He called Saul my father because of the position. In like manner, John, as a spiritual father to these people and here to Gaius, calls them his spiritual children. The Apostle Paul does this with Timothy and with Titus. The spiritual children. And he rejoices when he sees his spiritual children walking in the truth. Trust me when I say, as a minister of the gospel, that it does bring me great joy when I see people in this congregation walking in the truth. And we elders all agree with this. We probably don't express it enough, and that's a shortcoming on our part, to be sure. But think about you who are parents when you see your kids do something that is noteworthy and praiseworthy. Do you not rejoice? Does it not fill you with joy? Does it not, do you not rejoice when you have witnessed your child stand before us and make a public profession of faith? What a joy that is, that they have publicly acclaimed to us all before God and before all of us that they have appropriated for themselves the gospel. Do we not rejoice in that? And how we ought to rejoice when we see one another walking in the truth. Rejoice as we see others walking in the truth. Let it be a model for you. Now, of course, there is a bit of a subtle message for Gaius and a subtle message for us. Are we living in such a way to cause those in spiritual authority over us to rejoice? We all got uncomfortable, didn't we? John does not express this outwardly here. But as we know, as we've, you know, taken breaks and looked at the Ten Commandments of recent days, 
that when you see something commanded, the contrary sin is forbidden. When you see something forbidden, the contrary duty is required. So here we see John rejoicing that Gaius is walking in the truth. So the question then that Gaius ought to have asked himself right away, what can I do to demonstrate even more that I'm walking in the truth? What can you do to demonstrate more and more every day to those who have spiritual oversight over your souls that you are walking in the truth? That should be our question. Now, of course, I'm sure, and rightly so to a degree, depending on how you ask it, you may say, well, Pastor Jim, who do you answer to? I've got a whole presbytery. And uh, we sort of say this from time to time, tongue in cheek, but if ever I went off the rails, my wife would be the first one at Presbytery's door to say something. And she should. Do I live my life in such a way that those who have spiritual oversight over me are going to rejoice? Truth be told, I don't ask myself that question enough. I should. And when we think about the reality that Christ himself, despite ourselves, as the author of Hebrews says, and I have brought up from time to time, that Christ himself is not ashamed to call us brothers. That should be a motivation for us to continue to walk in the truth. It is not meant as a statement for us to say, well, Christ is not ashamed to call me brother. I can do whatever I want. No, that should motivate us. Christ wants to call me brother. He does call me brother. I got to live like a brother. I've got to walk as he did. That should be motivation. That's what this is, motivation. And see, all of this is connected to his prayer in verse 2. And it's fascinating because what John prays, he prays as a result of what he has heard about Gaius, and he's basically praying for the same thing that he just heard testimony about. Gaius is walking in the truth. He's rejoicing in that. But you know what John is praying in verse 2? That he would continue to walk in the truth. That's what he means when he says that it goes well with your soul. When you see, brothers and sisters, fellow brothers and sisters walking in the truth, rejoice, yes, but you know what you also ought to do? Pray that they would do so more and more. When we see our children, our literal children, make their public profession of faith before God and before the congregation. We don't sit there and say, we rejoice, they've arrived. What we do is we actually pray for them that they would continue to grow. That is the pattern of prayer that is set before us. And in fact, in a few moments, we're going to be participating in the Lord's Supper. One of the things that the Lord's Supper does for those who have faith is strengthen their faith. It gives them the strength that they need to continue to walk in truth. So as you pray for one another, recognize that what we have before us is a means of grace to enable us to walk in the truth and to enable us to rejoice in one another. That's why when we participate in the Lord's Supper, this really is a family meal because of our love for one another. Yes, primarily, it proclaims the Lord's death until he comes, but it is also a picture of our unity and fidelity that we have toward one another in Christ. And part of that involves rejoicing in one another as they walk in the truth and praying that all continues to go well with them. That's our prayer life. We use the Lord's Prayer, and rightfully so, in Matthew chapter 6, as a guide to help us pray. Think of this here in the first couple of verses of 3 John as a guide for praying for one another. 
use it. And also consider how you might be one who can walk their life in such a way that others will rejoice that you're walking in the truth. That's what we see here. Four simple verses. Themes that we've seen before coalescing once again into a beautiful harmony of what the Christian life ought to look like. May the Lord grant us grace to pray for one another, to rejoice in one another, and to live as those who walk in the truth. Amen. Let's pray. Our great God and Father in heaven, how we do rejoice in your word. Such simple truths that we see here. How easy it is for us to just quickly go over the simple truths. Lord, may we rejoice when we see other believers walking in the truth. May we live our lives in such a way that others rejoice in our walking in the truth. But may we also pray for one another that things go well, that they be in good health, and that all things go well with each other's soul. Thank you, Lord, for what you have accomplished for us in Christ Jesus. We pray all this in his name. Amen.